The government's plan to sell off state assets and cut public services is a radical one that will affect all New Zealanders. But what is the evidence it will improve the economy or benefit the country in the long term? Is New Zealand out of line with other modern economies with its rate of public spending? Is our debt so high that the government has no other choice? David Hall, director of the Public Services International Research Unit at the University of Greenwich, London, is an internationally recognised expert in public service investment, privatisation, asset sales and public-private partnerships. He was recently in New Zealand at the invitation of the PSA to raise awareness of these issues. In a debate in Wellington, he summed up the evidence that shows public spending is actually the driver of economic growth. Uh, what I have to say starts by simply talking about 140 years of human history, 140 years of economic growth and development, uh, in which the steady growth of economies has been accompanied by a steady growth of public spending. Not just at the same speed as economies, but rising even faster than growth. In other words, as economies grow, they spend an increasing proportion of uh, national income on public services, public spending and so on. So this is not something that holds back economic growth, it's something that delivers economic growth. Uh, in the world now, we're all currently spending, for, in the rich nations, something between 40 and 60 percent of GDP on public spending, very high levels. Sometimes people say it should be lower than that. Maybe we want to get back to 20% of GDP. That's where we were in the 1920s. That's where some African countries still are. 30% of GDP, that's where we were in the 1960s. That's where a lot of South American countries still are. But modern economies are all in the band of around 40 to 60%. So this uh, accompaniment of uh, economic growth um, by public spending is because public spending brings drivers of economic growth. Uh, this isn't just absorbing it, this is driving it. And it drives it in three or four key ways. The first one is infrastructure. Notoriously, private companies don't invest in infrastructure. The roads, the electricity, the railway systems, the telecom systems, water and sewerage systems, all countries of the world over the last 140 years that investment has come through uh, public spending. Uh, the uh, second area is developing what's sometimes called the soft infrastructure, the public services, the big services of health, education, uh, libraries, etc. The stuff that supports the growth and development of people, the stuff that supports and generates uh, an educated, competent uh, workforce capable of productive work. As economies grow, the demands get more complex, you need more education, you need more higher education. Uh, and that's why services continue to grow uh, as, uh, as economies grow. Why do we do it through the public sector? The answer, big surprise to some people, the economic answer is because it's more efficient to do it that way. Uh, the clearest way you can see this is with healthcare. And you can see it by looking at the USA, which has carried out a, a unique experiment of trying to run privately financed healthcare. The USA spends twice as much of its uh, GDP on healthcare as other countries, other advanced countries. It spends a sixth of its national income on healthcare, and it gets worse results. It has the 33rd uh, place in terms of life expectancy. It's poor in the USA. Uh, child mortality rates in the USA are twice what they are in the Czech Republic. So this is a system, private health care is a system that's both inefficient and ineffective. If we look more broadly across uh, various sectors, we see that the evidence from empirical studies comparing the efficiency of public and private operators in water, electricity, accounting, whole range of services, prisons, airports, the results come back again and again, there's no significant difference. This is reality. It's not what people, many people believe or assume or expect, but the reality from the empirical evidence is there is no superior efficiency from uh, private performance. So 
the third element of efficiency working in favour of the uh, public sector, and this is particularly relevant to the issue of PPPs, for example, is raising of finance, because the public sector can always raise finance more cheaply than the private sector. It raises finance more cheaply because our collective uh, readiness to carry on paying taxes is a stronger underwriting than any enterprise can deliver. So we have efficiency as a core function uh, that the uh, public services and public spending are delivering. How can we afford this as economies grow? How can we afford to spend more and more on public services? The answer is simple. It's the same way we, can, we, afford, we, we afford to spend more and more on television, mobile phones, etc. It's just that the things we get, uh, the, the, the things we need in terms of infrastructure, healthcare, education, we have to get through public spending. We can get it most efficiently through public spending. So rather than spending it out of our own pockets on that, we spend increasing amounts through taxation and public spending. Mm -hmm. The other thing we get out of public spending and public services is greater equality. In all societies, uh, in market uh, economies, uh, the initial distribution of income is very unequal. Taxes and benefits go a long way to redistributing that, so the poorer get more than where they started. But the other element of redistribution is public services themselves. By providing education, healthcare, and other services, we're providing enormously valuable things to people who otherwise wouldn't afford them. And for example, in the UK, for the poorest 20%, those services are worth almost as much as their entire monetary income. So equality has a big social advantage. It also has an economic advantage because it redistributes money to people who spend a higher percentage of it. So it means that there's more demand in the economy than there would be if it remained uh, with the rich. One result of all this is that it sustains high levels of employment. And uh, we've done a rough estimate that about 50% of all the jobs in the world are supported by public spending. That's not just by direct employment, by public em of public employees, for every one public employee supported by public spending, there's two private sector employees because governments purchase goods from the private sector and the multiplier effect of those employees, those employees uh, generates further work. So for every one public sector job, you have two private sector jobs. Sometimes this catalogue of achievements of the public sector isn't enough and people say, oh, it's not innovative. Uh, and I suppose that's right if you don't count inventing computers, the internet, space travel, jet aircraft, and penicillin, <laughs> uh, all of which came out of uh, the public sector. Okay, but has the economic crisis changed all this? Has the economic crisis shown us we can't afford to do this anymore? Uh, I think not, and I think not for some very strong reasons. The first is, and a big reminder to all of us, the economic crisis was not caused by government spending. It was not caused by government borrowing. It was not caused by government debt anywhere in the world. Uh, government debt in the world was level for 10 years before the economic crisis. What caused the economic crisis was unsustainable levels of private debt and irresponsible behavior by impeccably private banks. Uh, how did we rescue ourselves from this crisis? Well, it was by using public spending to nationalize, in many cases, those irresponsible private banks. We used huge amounts of money to do that. The money we spent nationalizing those banks was the equivalent of all the revenue from all the privatizations in the whole world over the last 30 years. That's what it cost us to prop up those banks and stop them failing. We then went further, right across the world, an unprecedented coordinated act of uh, economic policy, deliberately increasing public spending, deliberately increasing government deficits in order to boost demand, in order to stop unemployment rising even faster. That worked. Uh, unemployment would be far worse worldwide if that hadn't been done. It meant that public spending and government deficits worldwide went up by the good 4% of GDP. But we thought that was a price worth saying, worth paying, and we still should think that's a price uh, worth having to pay. Uh, what happens now? Uh, I think that uh, the crisis is not yet over. 
the threat of recession is not yet over. This is not a time to be starting to cut back uh, on public spending. Uh, we still need it to protect us. Is privatization or PPP some kind of substitute in some way? Well, you've had as uh, up and down the experience with privatization as any country in the world, so uh, I won't go through the details uh, of that experience. Perhaps some of the other panelists will. Uh, but I will say something about the idea that partial privatization uh, can somehow uh, result in a sort of mum and dad's uh, 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 popular ownership of industries, because that's what we thought in the UK. That's what Mrs. Thatcher thought in the 1980s, and we were all sold shares in these new privatized companies. But what we all then did, because we're fairly smart investors, is that when big companies came along and said, we'll give you 25% more for those shares, we sold them to them. Uh, and as a result, the privatized companies in the UK are now owned uh, to a very large extent by foreign-based multinationals. They're owned by French companies, German companies, Spanish companies, Chinese companies, Malaysian companies, Singaporean companies. Uh, so uh, beware of the illusion of uh, uh, selling uh, uh, shares to small shareholders. What also happens to prices is that uh, you get increases, uh, and in water, for example, 15% increases. So finally, to wrap up, I would say that we need public spending now as much as ever. We need to hold our nerve. It's rescued the world economy from the worst crisis. We need it now, we need it in the future, and we're going to need it for future needs as well, like combating climate change. Grow. They spend an increasing proportion of uh, national income on public services, public spending, and so on. So this is not something that holds back economic growth. It's something that delivers economic growth. Uh, in the world now, we're all currently spending, for, in the rich nations, something between 40 and 60 percent of GDP on public spending, very high levels. Sometimes people say it should be low. The government's plan to sell off state assets and cut public services is a radical one that will affect all New Zealanders. But what is the evidence it will improve the economy or benefit the country in the long term? Is New Zealand out of line with other modern economies with its rate of public spending? Is our debt so high that the government has no other choice? David Hall, direct driver of economic growth. Uh, what I have to say starts by simply talking about 140 years of human history, 140 years of economic growth and development uh, in which the steady growth of economies has been accompanied by a steady growth of public spending. Not just at the same speed as economies, but rising even faster than growth. In other words, as economies... ...of the Public Services International Research Unit at the University of Greenwich, London, is an internationally recognised expert in public service investment, privatisation, asset sales and public-private partnerships. He was recently in New Zealand at the invitation of the PSA to raise awareness of these issues. In a debate in Wellington, he summed up the evidence that shows public spending is actually the other than that. Maybe we want to get back to 20% of GDP. That's where we were in the 1920s. That's where some African countries still are. 30% of GDP, that's where we were in the 1960s. That's where a lot of South American countries still are. But modern economies are all in the band of around 40 to 60%. So this uh, accompaniment of